Well, thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, I'm Wade Crowfoot, and I serve as our Secretary of Natural Resources uh, here in California. And I am thrilled uh, to be in conversation with the one and only uh, Obi Kaufman today. Um, first of all, thanks for your patience. Uh, Murphy's Law of Coronavirus Pandemic. Uh, we went through uh, the technology a couple times uh, together, and then uh, our internet conked out uh, right before we went on. So appreciate you being on in this virtual discussion. Uh, you're one of actually several hundred uh, participants here today uh, to be part of a discussion that is really unlike any I've, I've uh, facilitated yet at the Natural Resources Agency. As Obi knows, we have created a what we call a secretary speaker series to, to bring uh, big thinkers and doers from outside of state government uh, into the agency uh, to talk to our staff, our employees, 20,000 strong, and really have a public dialogue uh, with other people in Sacramento. Uh, traditionally, that's been an in-person event uh, that's been live streamed, um, but obviously as a result of the pandemic and us all working remotely, or many of us working remotely, um, we're able to share this conversation uh, across California. And I'm told actually there are folks uh, that have logged on uh, from across the country. So I'll tell you, uh, just as a point of, of um, you know, uh, personal privilege, I'm so excited to be having this conversation with, with Obi. Uh, he knows I'm actually uh, a huge fan, uh, totally outside of uh, the work that I do with the Natural Resources Agency. And uh, I'm a fan because I think he brings a singular voice uh, to the discussion of, of nature in California. I spent a lot of my time when I moved out to California reading John Muir, who's of course, uh, you know, the, the, the grandfather of the conservation movement in, 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 in the world, if not the, the nation. And he spoke of California nature uh, with a passion and reverence um, that just conveyed incredible energy. And it actually wasn't until I picked up uh, the California Field Access Atlas and, and read, um, uh, the words of Obi that I, I felt that sort of similar um, buzz. Um, so Obi, I've now compared you to John Muir in the first three minutes of our discussion. So, uh, you know, no pressure. But let's start out by uh, just, you know, there's probably a lot of folks on uh, in watching this discussion that know of, of who you are. But for those uh, who don't, who is Obi Kaufman and where did he come from and, and, and what got you to do what you do? Thank you, Wade. Can you hear me okay? Sure can. Okay, great. And I, I really appreciate that introduction. And I really appreciate you inviting me to come on this forum. Uh, yeah, we've got, we have some, we have some uh, technical problems this morning. I won't be able to be sharing my paintings with you. Uh, it looks like uh, I'm just going to have to do this whole little conversation through the phone. But I think we have enough to talk about today to keep it uh, exciting and, and alive. You just want to have, you want to have the, uh, the, the uh, visual, visual accompaniment, which you know, is always just so valuable, especially to someone like myself, a painter, uh, you know, wanted to show the audience the paintings, but you can, you can go to you know, my Instagram, which is at Coyote Thunder, or you can go to, uh, maybe, maybe you've already got your books, my books in your collection. So you can just thumb through these and, and, and pretend that I am, uh, I'm giving you a tour through them. Yeah, so as I say, Wade, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate how much work you have to do and to be tagged by you like this to tell you who I am at all is a huge honor. Uh, you know, there are, there are long-winded answers and there are short-winded answers to that question, who I am. <laughs> I think that I uh, um, probably put it best or at least most succinctly in the in the end of my state of water book when I uh, really wanted to define who I was by just just simple labels right because uh, I knew that particularly that book the state of water being about what might be the most contentious issue <laughs> across the California uh, demographic right now water it always has been and most likely always will be I define myself with a particular voice, right? I am a native Californian. I was um, born in Hollywood in 1973, native meaning in this instance that I was born here. Uh, my father was 
an astrophysicist. My mother was a clinical psychologist. So I have a long history of, of uh, uh, thinking about what science is. And of course they made a painter. <laughs> and that's uh, my first identity and it will probably be my last. I uh, grew up on the, I grew up in the sage mazes in the oak forests, the Mount Diablo right here uh, in, in the East Bay. Uh, and today I still live in Oakland. I went to school at UC Santa Barbara. So, you know, I've spent my whole life traipsing around the state, learning about it and communicating my love for it. You know, and this, these books are the manifestation of that, the conclusion of that. And it is a journey that I began in 2017 with the publishing of the California Field Atlas. I continued with the state of water and we'll continue with a total of four other books that are coming out over the next three years going into uh, an in-depth exploration about uh, the ecology of California, its resiliency, its vulnerabilities, its history, and its future. And OB, that's uh, I'm, I'm excited to talk about the books and, and the work, but um, let me ask you, I, I, when I've heard you talk before, you've talked about um, this sort of seminal experience you had in Santa Barbara going uh, to college to study science and then being uh, deeply impacted by um, the paintings of the Chumash uh, peoples uh, in the hills above Santa Barbara. Um, and it would be interesting just to hear uh, how that actually impacted uh, your, your pathway. Um, and let me just say that uh, poor Obi has just got kicked off uh, our, uh, there he is. Um, so Obi, the, the influence of, of your experience with the Chumash uh, tribal paintings, I'm really intrigued how that sort of uh, impacted your trajectory. Oh, I could talk about it all day for sure. You know, I mean, I get asked like, who are your, who are your big uh, influences of, as are as a painter? You know, like I, my style is, is, is rendering wildlife and watercolor in a, in a specific sort of cultural way, right? Um, because it's how I make sense of my reality. And it's about how we all make sense of, of uh, you know, in, in sort of this like Western European style of, of, of uh, graphic composition really you know my eyes were open when i went to uc santa barbara and spent my college career skipping class and running into the san Inez mountains to find <laughs> still extant you know there's still there hundreds and hundreds of art sites where you might have like a a vaguely um like a, like like the vague representation of what might be a condor in front of some sort of eclipse with maybe like a maybe a, a human leg and a, and a, or some sort of centipede motif coming down from the right side or something like that. I have no idea. In fact, a lot of what the specific narrative of those paintings uh, describe has been lost. But what I do understand as a human, as, um, as an artist, was that artist's probing the natural world through their own cultural language in their own cultural context, right? So on that level, my eyes were open to the possibility of what story is really and the power of art to convey what we collectively refer to as truth, okay? so. I'm describing, I think, what is maybe an anthropological um, phenomenon, which is really this thing that we all share, which is, and this directly ties into my views of ecology, uh, this idea that is completely unique in the history of life on Earth which is the technology of storytelling. Mm -hmm. I guess it probably began about 100,000 years ago in what anthropologists term the cognitive revolution, right? Where we in invented this idea of fiction at all. We began to 
what, what, what in essence we do, and which, which, which is an evolutionarily endowed gift that rivals even the opposable thumb or bipedalism, is that I can manifest my animal instinct outside of my corporeal body and hand it to you in the form of a story. Mm. Because of that technology, that all of this came into place. We were followed by a couple of other technical, technological revolutions, including the, the agricultural revolution about 20,000 years ago, and then followed, of course, by the industrial revolution, which probably, I don't know, you could say that it began one Saturday afternoon in 1775 when James Watt fired up the first coal-powered steam engine and let first the first industrial uh, carbon emission into the atmosphere, uh, anthropogenic industrial carbon emission into the atmosphere. Uh, uh, and what are we doing now? I believe that we are speeding towards, or maybe it's speeding towards us, this next revolution, this ecological shift, where we yeah. are, what is, what is becoming maybe the post-carbon economy? And then, I want to talk. Yeah. I want to talk about that. I just want to spend a little bit more time on your storytelling. A lot of us who work on, on natural resources in the environment, at least in our world, you know, we're in a very uh, policy focused world. Uh, right. And so we, we talk a lot about law, regulation, science, but it's very difficult to access sort of more transcendental values of sort of love and wisdom and the awe of nature. And what's so interesting about your, your California field atlas is, you know, uh, is de by definition, or, you know, you think field atlas is going to be this very um, cut and dry um, way that you can identify uh, nature, you know, in its, in, its, um, in its natural form. And you are managed to balance so much information about the ecology of California, but in this way that you're really telling stories. This is obviously a painting of, uh, of a California condor. And if I can, just because I find it, I find it really uh, pretty inspirational, I just wanted to, to read for folks uh, your introduction um, to reading and enjoying the California Field Atlas. Um, because to me, it just speaks to this prose um, that you are gifted with. And so it starts, uh, this is a love story. California is the land I was born and where having spent a happy life walking through its forests and sleeping out under its stars, I hope to someday die, far off trail under some unnamed sequoia. My spirit is of this place, and to sing of its living spirit is to sing the most interesting song I've ever heard. Although I understand California's puzzle, like personality, as well as I have ever understood anything, I still feel like a novice, an infatuated child, a lost and humble beggar asking for its natural wisdom. I want to hold the whole California in my hand, like a diamond or a spinning top. I want to coax this single piece of the universe into opening up its secrets. So talk about talk about how you're, you know, sort of how you're working to tell a story and to tap into just that deep passion, while at the same time, you know, you're educating us about of our natural places. Thank you. And thank you for helping me out with those visual aids there, Wade. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, I am, uh, I am an artist. I, um, I look to science for truth, at least for objective truth. There's also, as Neil deGrasse Tyson would say, there's also personal truth and political truth. But I look to art for meaning. Right, so all of my artwork is data driven, but I am not a research scientist. Okay, so I'm not about to leave you alone with the facts and the figures based on analysis. I'm an artist and I use that very clearly and decisively as both a shield and a license to tell what I believe is not only a better story than I think the one that we are fed through whatever popular discourse, most of the time, a very divisive discourse. But I think it's, it is the best story. And what I mean by that is that it places all of humanity in this context, right? So I get to use something that scientists don't get to use. I get to use 
metaphor, okay? So I get to use poetry to get at metaphor to point to the truth of scientific principles. For example, in my new book, The Forests of California, which uh, I'll reveal, reveal here today, the first sentence of my new book, well, you just read the first sentence of my last book, California Field Atlas, this is a love story. The first sentence of my new book, The Forests of California, is that this is a family album. Okay, so my relationship, my love for this place has evolved and matured in using California as a metaphor for a larger context for who we are and where we're going. And Wade, yeah, you, you are a policymaker. You discuss, you, you debate the science. I am a storyteller. I am not a pundit. You know, I'm not here to tell you, well, one, your job. No, no, no. I'm not here to tell a farm how to farm. You know, I'm not here to convince anyone of anything. I will go that far. You know, I going out on book tour for the state of water, I, I, it was very important for me to, to, to get it right in my head, uh, the story that I'm trying to tell, right? And, and, and if I, for example, if I found myself arguing with somebody in the audience about one thing or the other, you know, if I were to present my truth as a, as, as a truth that is, that needs to be argued at all, like it's some sort of judicial procedure or, um, you know, uh, some sort of adjudication that needs to happen, I know that I will have already have lost that argument, if it even mm -hmm. be. What I'm here to do is to tell a better story. And it's my conviction that that's the only thing that's ever changed anybody's mind ever anyway, right? Yeah, Ab that's absolutely. And I wanna talk about that in the context of biodiversity. Um, and as I do that, I'll just share uh, another, as, as Obi's audio visual assistant here, um, this is another uh, set of pages from the Atlas, uh, and it identifies the geography of the San Francisco Bay, uh, but obviously with its uh, incredible life in it as well. And you have a quote um, that I want to share about biodiversity, and it says, we have the capacity to crack our hearts open for a deeper understanding of our connection to place and that story that we can collectively tell about our responsibilities balancing those rights towards all biodiversity. So talk about, well, I mean, what, you know, biodiversity is kind of a wonky term, you know, environmentalists understand it, a lot of people don't, it gets used in different ways. How would you tell California's story of biodiversity and why it matters? <laughs> oh, that, that, that's a, that is a uh, really astute observation, yeah. Uh, it's a, it, it can be a wonky term. And in fact, there's a lot of debate about its intrinsic uh, value uh, in ecological circles. And what I mean by that, let's begin by saying that all of this science is very young. You know, biodiversity as a word is only 50 years old. You know, I mean, we really, we really get it from like, I think of uh, Wilson and MacArthur in the, uh, in the theory of biogeography in, in 1968, when we actually applied Darwin's evolutionary theory to ecosystems at all. We already knew the structure of genetic, genetic code for 15 years. By the time we like actually applied Darwinian theory to ecosystem ecology at all, you know, like that, um, that, that's just an example of how young this is, right? So we've got, we've got the Greta Thunbergs of the world in our face and in our hearts now, saying that, that, that we need to go faster, we need to go faster. I'm here to tell you that we're going exceedingly fast, that I'm seeing science follow our values and our values following science as it's unfolding. And it is all very new. Those people who maybe argue that, oh, we, we know everything, we know everything about everything. We know very, the, the amount that we don't know is amazing. We don't know why leaves are shaped differently. We don't know fundament, we understand that, you know, phenotype follows genotype and that kind of thing, but we don't understand why leaves are shaped differently. Why are there many things and not one thing? Um, 
what is biodiversity? Is biodiversity, is, is it like we're all just sort of like species on this airplane called California and we're all sitting there in our little seats, you know, uh, where all, all the different species are lined up and we're, we're, we're just cruising at altitude in this plane? Or is biodiversity itself the rivets that are holding the plane together? Hmm. And it, it, it is emerging with uh, evolving ideas of uh, trophic cascades, for example, how the miss, um, a one missing piece might collapse the whole web uh, throughout feedback circles that we can't yet um, describe fully. So that being said, uh, what we've got here in California presently is all of our current ecosystems, all of our current landscape types, right? All of our, all of our current habitats, uh, this, this mosaic across the entire California floristic province, every single one of them is either threatened or endangered by a variety of factors, right? But what we are enjoying is a miracle. And this leads to my larger point, that for every point of despair, there's a point of hope. We're enjoying this miracle wave that we have a very low extinction rate. It's actually less than 1%. Everything is all still here. Now we've lost a lot of our beautiful charismatic megafauna, including that, that gorgeous beast that we put on our flag, on our state flag, uh, the California grizzlies. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. But the rest of it, I mean, salmon are still here. We knew when we started building the big dams on the big rivers that uh, that was gonna be the end of salmon. We said it explicitly in so many, in so many reports from you know, about 100 years ago, 80 years ago, when we built those big, big dams. Uh, but, this, but we just proved just two years ago that for the first time we saw Spring Run Chinook spawn for the first time south of Korean Dam on the San Joaquin River. Uh, we proved that we could do it. It's a hugely expensive effort, but we proved that we could do it. We are waking up, and this gets to what you just read there. We are waking up to, and this is probably more so the, our most precious resource, right? I call it water, my, the, the state of water, understanding California is the most precious resource. That's a subtitle in my book. I really believe that our most precious resource is now, not water at all, but truth, trust, and hope between us, the connectivity between us as a human species, right? Uh, between having, being able to have that space to discuss the, what is a right and what is a responsibility. You hear a lot, mm. you know, we throw around this word freedom like it means nothing or it means everything. You know, you ask most people, like, what is freedom? And, like, freedom's like, oh, I get to do whatever I want. It's like, no, that would be a child's definition of freedom, you know? Freedom is the agency to show up for your social responsibilities without some sort of governmental entity telling you what those responsibilities are. That's mm -hmm. a much nuanced definition of what freedom is. And actually going forward, as we discuss the value and indeed the moral imperative of, for example, putting replenishment at the same level as extraction, as going forward. Every bit of extraction needs to be balanced with some amount of replenishment. Hmm. So that, uh, talking about human ecology, influencing the more than human ecology of California and vice versa is a path forward into the larger and more important question of what is 22nd century conservation policy going to look like across California. And I want to I want to ask you about that. And I just want to also share just um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to to spend time with Obi's. Uh, these are watercolors, right, Obi? Yep, all watercolors. Yeah, I'm an oil painter for yeah, many. Years. It's. I mean, they're just incredibly evocative. So not only is he, is he essentially painting his maps, but he's painting the flora and fauna um, that is native to California in um, just uh, such an incredible way. And I, think, and I think it's in the atlas that you say, you know, this is not the book that's, that's meant to be read front to back. <laughs> right. um, it's, and uh, I can tell you, I, I don't do it. I, I, I don't uh, read it that way too. I kind of dig in and then dig out and, and learn something uh, new. Let me ask you about this time because I've heard you talk about that sort of the 
the fierce urgency of now versus the sort of the geologic um, age of the planet. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I pull a quote that says, the California I describe knows less of humanity in both the past and the future. And I think a lot of us that work on these issues, um, you know, encounter a lot of fear and discouragement because we just feel like, oh boy, the world, you know, could end as we know it. And I think the point you make is the world's not going to end. Uh, it's just going to evolve. And you show this amazing um, image of California as we know it sort of shearing off or parts of California shearing off from the continent in some distant future. And to me, that, that's kind of, um, that makes me uncomfortable. But to you, I get a sense of sort of comfort and peace in that. So talk about how, you know, you're kind of speaking of time in a pretty radical way amidst the climate movement and all this that says now, now, now. Right. Yeah, because we're we're wired to think of the now, now, now. I mean that that that's our that's our that's our that's, uh, that goes with uh, you know the neolith neolithic emotional system that we that we're all inheritors of. The perspective that I um, want to give and that you just described is one that pulls the lens all the way back, and I find that sort of deep knowledge of both the deep past and the deep future as being a excellent vantage from which to consider how life on earth works in our context therein. Uh, for example, you were talking about, yeah, I've, I've, got, I've got paintings coming up uh, in my next book. I've got a good one about how California is gonna look like in 10 million years. And you know you can juxtapose that with, and that uh, uh, so th that's looking forward about ten million years when we know exactly how California is going to look. The the island of Baja will will shear off and go continue its way north uh, up um, up the conveyor belt to the San Andreas Fault until finally it becomes a suburb of what will be the archipelago of San Francisco. Ten million years from now, that enormous beautiful island of uh, of Baja will be inhabited with species that we cannot yet imagine. So uh, speciation occurs on islands uh, uh, with great variety. That's why we have such an, an, an impressive amount of biodiversity uh, that rivals uh, anywhere on the planet uh, for the number and uh, uh, just general quantity of species of both flora and fauna as we are effectively an island separated by the Sierra Nevada from the rest of the continental botanical province. That island that I'm describing, the island of Baja 10 million years from now, will placental mammals even be the order of the day like they have been for the past tens of millions of years? Who's to say we cannot, nobody knows that, but the fact that that will happen, the fact that we are, as many scientists declare that we are, on the brink, if not fully immersed in the sixth mass extinction on the planet, there will be a seventh. In fact, if we were to stand on a mountain peak, right? Give me this metaphor, as you're standing on the mountain peak and you're looking towards uh, the beginning of life on planet Earth about three and a half billion years ago to the east, or you're looking now to the west, that too, the west, the end of life on planet Earth, that too is about the same distance away, about 3.5 billion years from now, when the core of our hot little sun begins to shrink and brighten on its path of its own solar evolution until finally the oceans are evaporated and even all bacteria is destroyed. That's about three and a half billion years in the other direction from now. We are in the middle of life on Earth and there's nothing that we can do that will change that story. There will be a seventh mass extinction. There will be a 13th mass extinction. You know, that's how big this scope is and, and how fortunate we are. And to that's not scary to you. What's that? That's it's not scary to you. And you're, you're not scared of me? Is that what you said? What? No, is that not scary to you? I mean, to think about it. Oh, in fact, I find that very relieving. I, I find that there's nothing that we can do that will change that story except for 
The only thing that we can change is how much of that future we are here to see. That is hmm. within our agency. That was, and by agency, I mean our general ability to, to decide. Uh, that is within our power to see. As much of the future as we want to see, we can see, and it's up to us. That's, that's really course. well put. Let me, well, I want to ask you. I have to, I, have to, I have to correlate that real fast because that sounds like some sort of, of truism. That sounds like some sort of prophetic statement, like, like there's a definite yes or no, there's, there's a definite choice to be made. And I don't believe that either. I think that the nature of all of this and the why I'm writing the big sort of Game of Thrones of California nature over six books is that every ecological truth is nuanced. There's no, there's, there's, there's no blanket statement. And that, that's something that I learned again and again there's no blanket statement that can be true. And I and hmm. and it's for this reason, it's for this reason that I reject so much of the divisive culture that we're embroiled in all the time. You know. So, yeah, I want to ask you about that. I want to yeah. um, let folks know uh, who are tuning in that in just a little bit we'll we'll move to uh, answer some questions uh, from those participating. And to ask a question, um, please email secretary suggestions at resources.ca.gov. Again, that's secretary suggestions at resources.ca.gov. That's our virtual suggestion box in the agency. Um, and, uh, and then our colleague Lizzie is gonna share those with us via text that I'll read. Um, let me ask that question then, Obi. So you're this you know, great lover of, of nature and, and uh, all that is California. And you take on a topic like water. Um, right. which is uh, easily uh, or arguably the most contentious uh, in natural resources policy. Many of us, myself included, spend time uh, navigating very difficult questions of, of you know, economic prosperity and viability and the survival of you know, our plants and animals. Yet you've somehow managed to write this book that's gotten quite popular about water without taking a position on one side or the other, fish versus farms, north versus south, urban versus rural. And uh, that makes you a kind of a, you know, your own unique uh, species in California. But, <laughs> you know, I guess the question is, you know, I, how and how and why? I, yeah. I, yeah. That you, how and why? Yeah, there's, there was Shasta Dam, right? Um, and and you know, I, I don't think that it does. I, you know, I've been on book tour for, for, for uh, um, gosh, it seems like for years. <laughs> and, you know, I've, been, I've gone all over the state and I've talked to all kinds of people. And, and I see this electric network of people that are really ready to show up for what needs to be done. I think there's a lot of false decisiveness there's a lot of false truths that are sold to us and i think it's very important for people to realize how much money is being made at us being separated from one another with all of these artificial fabrications about you know red versus blue or you know urban versus rural or or more importantly perhaps relevantly is like like farms versus fish my goodness you know what a what a what what a false dichotomy a lot of those are we all want well, I, the majority of us want, how about that? I won't speak for everybody. Again, all ecological truths are nuanced. Uh, the majority of us, I believe, want uh, a way forward that is sustainable. And, you know, we all do care about our grandchildren. And, um, and spending the days at war with one another is a red herring, okay? To use another fish water metaphor. <laughs> 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 um, I, I, you know, I, I appreciate that you think that I don't necessarily take a stand because I do, I do want that book. Uh, I, have a, I have a good, I have a funny relationship with that book. You know, I mean, I, I, I was going to write about California nature until the day I died, right? So I, I you know, but my publisher, Steve Wasserman of Heyday Books, he, uh, I, I presented my work about two years ago at the Mechanics Library in San Francisco, and um, and he took me out for a drink afterwards. And he dared me to write that book because I was lamenting that, I, yeah, state of water. I needed to write that book because I needed to understand water infrastructure in California in order to return to write my next book, The Forests of California, 
what Californians have done over the past 170 years is the lion's share of it has been done within the last century with California altered the uh, waterscape of California, the most single most altered aspect of California's topography rivals anything humans have ever done with anything anywhere. It is total in its um, completion. But I believe, and this probably gets to exactly what you were asking me, that the most interesting part of it is how it will again change over the next 170 years as we respond, adapt, and innovate towards uh, uh, the needs of, you know, what do we got? We got 20 more million people in the next 15 years uh, with, within our state boundaries, you know? So like, like as, we, as we find better ways to use less water, and with, with, here's a word that's tossed around in, 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 in water circles a lot, and with these co-equal uh, goals of maintaining the values that we think are important. We wanna keep all the pieces on the table. Remember before I was talking about our low extinction rate, all the pieces are still on the table. Let's keep them on the table. Given all of this stuff, it's my conclusion that we have the opportunity right now to leave the 21st century in better shape than we left the 21st. I'm sorry, we have the ability right now to leave the 21st century with California's natural world in better shape than we left it at the end of the 20th century. Wow. And you, um, I know you write about, uh, you know, there's so much to be concerned about on the, uh, on the environment and, and, and you acknowledge that, but you also write about these amazing success stories and the comeback of, of nature in different parts of California. And I find that encouraging. I want to ask a question that um, has been posed by one of our participants here today, and it, it addresses watersheds, uh, which is a great segue between uh, the state of water, which is uh, your this this last book, and then um, the uh, the state of forests. Um, yes. And I just want to quote uh, from the advanced copy of um, of uh, on forests, which is. Is a uh, Forests of California is a story about the survival strategy of reinforcing connectivity, not only between habitat species, but between members of our own species. So the question on the uh, on watersheds comes from a Grass Valley City Council person um, living in the Bear Yuba watershed. And this person says, in the state of water, Obi talks about salmon as a seminal species contributing to the health of our California watersheds. Wade was appointed by Governor Newsom um, and uh, as secretary of the Natural Resources Agency, ecology and conservation are inherently political, as we are seeing play out with various iterations of the state budget and various exemptions within the budget um, that may cause uh, an oversight or shortfall in waterways in my community. What do the two of you think needs to be done at the political level to ensure the overall health of California watersheds? So, Obi, this I know is a question that sort of you get to as you're trying to kind of bring it up a level. Folks are saying yes, but there's all this, you know, there's all this potential impact uh, on watershed. So, answer that however you want, and then I'll I'll share a few thoughts as well. Oh right, yeah. Let's let's just get right to it, huh? All right. Um, you know, yeah. So that particular question about Centennial Dam there on the on on the Bear River, which might, as I understand, in the new budget is is uh, might not go under the same sort of critical review. Uh, it might be exempted somehow. From the um, from the uh, environmental act that governs all you know, mm. a new future project, and that would be very important to consider because we need we need to consider these things and not acquiesce to big business interests. And that and that dam doesn't make any sense to me. Another dam on on San Joaquin on the San Joaquin River doesn't make any sense to me. The Temperance Flat Dam seems like a non-starter. Uh, you know, it would be I. It doesn't look like the raising of Shasta Dam is going to happen by 18 feet because that would be a wholly illegal act. So I hope that that doesn't go through. We we've also got the largest dam removal coming coming down the pipe uh, in the history of America with uh, the dams re removed off the Shasta Dam. The I'm sorry, off the Klamath River, off the Klamath River that uh, represents the last best hope for wild salmon in California. And we've also got some water projects that are moving forward. I am not anti-dam. I'm anti-dumb dam, sure. But you know, it, it, as our as our infrastructure is aging and becoming more dangerous and nearing the end of its useful life across the board, we have to discuss uh, different water storage uh, um, 
uh, answers. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't agree that Stites Dam on the, on the uh, uh, western side of the Sacramento Valley is a very good um, idea. Um, but I do, you know, there, the, we've got Los Vaqueros down there is, is, is scheduled for an increase in capacity. And, uh, and I understand a new dam is going in uh, near Pacheco Peak, too. So we've got lots of pieces moving around. I think, you know, I mean, it'll be really interesting. You know, I think in my lifetime, as we are upgrading San Francisco's water, I think Hetch Hetchy is a big player that's still on the table. You know, if we yeah. can, if, if we can, uh, uh, up the technology and change the political will a little bit. I think that uh, you know we might we might uh, we might see that valley return. So you know I mean that that that's my two cents. No, that's helpful. Let, let, we got a few more questions are starting to stream in. Let me just say um, on the Centennial Dam, I, I don't believe there's anything in the state budget that exempts or limits environmental review, but um, folks should get in contact with our office if they think that. And then more broadly on watersheds, I think broadly we well we need to. We need to treat watersheds like the natural infrastructure that it is, um, both it's an ecosystem, but it's also terribly valuable to our our um, our, our system of, of uh, water in the state and and actually protecting those watersheds and their natural function um, is good water policy. So for me, if I had a magic wand, uh, our, our water policy and our forest policy would overlap uh, in a more integrated way to protect watersheds. Uh, another question from Jennifer Savage, who's a great coastal advocate in the state, uh, saying, uh, Obi, given how unique your books are and the sweet spot they inhabit between science and art, illustration and advocacy, I imagine your readership expands into many demographics. With that in mind, she's curious, what favorite surprising or memorable responses to your books have you had? Huh, that's fantastic. I think this one probably tops the cake, my friend. <laughs> You know, I mean, I mean, sitting here with you today is 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 a high point not only of my career but of my life. I, you know, you just mentioned the magic wand, and I'm 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 sitting here talking with, you know, the uh, uh, state secretary of natural resources with your sixteen thousand employees and your near near nine billion dollar budget. That that's a pretty big magic wand. You know, all I've got is words and paintings. You know, um, uh, so so you know, I I I, I, I I'm very I'm very happy to be working with you here to telling a better story you know i think just to, just to um just to answer this question and to and to go back to the last question about watersheds you know i one of the things that i found that was so interesting about the forest of california and the writing of this new book that's coming out in the fall is is that there's basically two animals not mentioned, not, not including human beings. Human beings are probably the most important, but there are two animals, the restoration of which across California's watershed will not only incite the re a resurgence of biodiversity, but represent the coming of, of a new age of abundance across California's natural world, and that is the beaver and the salmon. Uh, historically, that be, the work of those two animals through these complex systems of nutrients delivery. I mean, you think of, you think of only a hundred years ago when the spring Chinook run was 500,000 strong. And we're talking about people sized salmon are returning as part of their anatomous life cycle, returning to their headwaters, depositing their bodies, giving hundreds of thousands of metric tons of nitrogen and phosphorus and calcium back into these forests and sending it down river, flooding across the Great Central Valley. This is how our ecography, our spatial ecology has worked for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, across, you know, across the beaver terraces, there were beaver, anyway, there was an there was a, there's estimates out there that across watersheds in California, uh, uh, prior to the gold rush, it, well, prior to the beaver, the the the, the beaver rush of the 1830s, mm -hmm. uh, there there was beaver like there were two or three per kilometer of watercourse. You know, it and when you have this beaver pond, you know the the the, the a a species that is old that whose engineering um, capacity rivals humanity and their ability to sculpt landscapes and environments and keep watersheds happy is just a natural factory of biodiversity. 
So reintroducing habitat and reinforcing and securing populations of both salmon and beaver is our best uh, step forward to, you know, future California forests, or at least, you know, that's a piece of the puzzle. Again, there's no ecological. Yeah, yeah it's reintroducing those natural functions. Um, <clears throat> question from Beth Pratt, who works for the National Wildlife Federation. Um, love to hear your vision, Obi, of um, what you hope wild California looks like in 100 years. Are mountain lions still in LA? Are wolves back in the Central Valley? Grizzly bears at the Golden Gate? Um, what's, your, what's, what's your vision 100 years from now? Oh, you know, I'm 120. I love it. I love it. You know, I mean, given massive projects like um, uh, the restoration of Salton Sea or the uh, or the wildlife crossing at Liberty Canyon across the 101 connecting the Simi Hills with the Santa Monica Mountains, we have a chance to keep these to keep all of the pieces on the board, those remaining pieces, whether or not I mean, a grizzly bear is something much different than a black bear. Okay, so black bears have done really yeah. well without grizzly bears. I mean, there's approximately about 14,000 black bears or something like that in California right now. Um, but, you know, the average size of a black bear is about 400 pounds or so, you know, or that's a, you know, 500 pounds is a big black bear. A normal California grizzly was about 2,000 pounds, you know, and so mm -hmm. a completely different kind of ursine predator and they and because of it they um they uh you know have, have all of these different needs i mean you had to have you had to have a river full of chinook salmon that was you know a sacramento river that was that was you know in flood season 25 miles wide full of salmon in order to support that kind of life form you know and that and 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 dealing with the human ecology now that m m it might take more than 100 years it'll come back you know especially if we keep the places it, the pieces on the board and what i mean by it will come back is that we will find a path forward together there's nothing that says healthy ecosystem like an apex predator and and mm -hmm. that their effects cascade trophically down through all levels of the ecosystem but again you know you have to you have to maintain the the bottom of that of of that chain as well so it, it it's it's bottom up it's top down i think we've got a lot of abiotic uh factors to contend with too with the health of our forests uh namely fire our relationship to fire we've got to get right with fire my last of the six books will be will bookend state of water it will be the state of fire how where and why california burns california burns like no other corner of the globe our entire floristic province our entire entire floristic province has a relationship with fire every single species in it has yeah. a way of dealing with fire unlike you know like the amazon for example the great tragedy of the burning in the amazon is is that forest has no relationship to fire our forest is different, but you know, we also have to tell a better story and it's not just things like uh, trees are the answer. I saw that, I, or plant trees, trees are the answer. I see that bumper sticker a lot. Ah, that's not right. We, we have more trees in California right now than we have ever had, than California has ever had in its history of California. You know, in the yep. six million years or so since California has, has tectonically resembled its current, you know, configuration. Uh, there have never been more trees than there are now. We don't need more trees. What we need are healthy forests. We need yeah, health. that's totally well. And I think it's going to be so fun to watch you and read you uh, in coming years as you develop this so-called Game of Thrones of uh, California nature. That's going to be incredible. <laughs> so reciprocal. incredible treat. Oh, thank you, brother. Such the same way about you. I can't wait to see what you do, man. A uh, question from um, uh, Susan Tatayan, who, who leads our Delta Stewardship Council on your artistic influences. She was curious if you've been influenced by, jo by Joan Didion, but I'll, I'll expand the question to say, who else has kind of uh, moved you and, and kind of uh, helped shape your own uh, approach to the work? Uh, Joan Didion, uh, yeah. Where I am from is on my nightstand right now, and certainly the, her essay on water in the White Album is is seminal. And 
and important. Um, you know, I was I was looking at my nightstand the other day and I was shocked to find that all of the authors there were women. Um, we've got Elizabeth Colbert's The Sixth Extinction. We've got Camille Paglia's 42 Greatest Poems. We've got Joan Didion. We've got Robert, Robin Wall Kimmerer braiding sweetgrass. We've got uh, Terry Tempest William, This Hours of Land. We've got Gretel Ehrlich. Uh, island home. We've got um, you know so so you know you think about the future is fe is is female. The present is female. And in in the new book, well, it's not that new at this point. It's called uh, Breakdown. It's um, it's the most uh, uh it, not Ehrlich. What's his name? I have it right over there. Oh, oh, Drawdown Project Our Drawdown. Paul Hawken. Paul Hawken. That's right. What a what a and. Uh, what, it, Inside his top 10 things, three of them have to do with women's rights, as if we were to simply, one, give women around the world equity commensurate with the work they do in industry, which is a tall order, I understand, but two, make sure that every girl graduates secondary or high school, and three, invest a paltry $4 billion in family planning, what that means by the year 2050 is removal of 160 gigatons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which, yeah. in, so, so the idea, so if that's ecofeminism, sign me up, you know, if treating women equally will, is, is, in the top 10 things that we can do as a species to draw down atmospheric carbon dioxide, um, the yeah. present is certainly female. It's amazing. Um, we're getting to the bottom of the hour, so I might just end with a couple of questions. Um, Obi, we've managed to go 55 minutes without talking about coronavirus, which I'm sure is a welcome vacation to everybody. But you know, let's just mark this moment. And you've got a, you've got a great essay uh, on your website, Coyote and Thunder that talks about the pandemic. And it's a gr there's an amazing painting of it's uh, COVID and the Corvid, which is the scientific name, I think, of the crow or raven. That's um, right. And, uh, but in that, in that uh, you know, essay, you observe, you know, at once we're in a time of full-blown panic and a time of fundamental reevaluation. And you talk about a paradox. Today, we move inside a paradox, finding ourselves more of this world and more removed from it than we ever have been before. And I can really relate to that. On the one hand, I see these, I, I have some friends that are considering this a great pause, the great pause and really trying to step away. And then there are people like me with less discipline that are logging on to CNN, the first thing we get up and um, you know, enraged at the president's latest tweet or concerned about the you know, ongoing spread. So just given your, own perspective and your big picture thinking about how this all fits together. Thoughts on the moment we find ourselves in and, and, and any words you have for, for all of us as we navigate this together? Yeah, Wade, I mean, I mean the, 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 the form of the thought has changed, notably in the past, you know, 73 days or whatever it is. Um, but the the frequency of the the frequency remains. That frequency of of panic on the horizon. I see it. I see it in this in this endless book tour I'm telling you about. Where I'm just having a great time, and really believing in the people of California as I've never as I've never before. You know, I spent most of my youth in that misanthropic malaise of 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 what have we done to this place? You know, when in fact the answers are right here. At our fingertips as well. I I see at every one of my stops, somebody stands up and, and with like panic in their eyes, uh, believing in, in you know, totally bought into like you know the the story that I'm telling and ready and ready to run with it. Not sure where to run to, what to do, what can I do right now? And I I always ask them a question. It's like, well, when was the last time you went camping? You know go to the Yuba River, go to your favorite water course, take your shoes off, 
touch that old water, you know, touch that old water. We're going to need you grounded. We're going to need you centered and we're going to need you unpanicked. Okay. So that is, that is the first step. Uh, whatever comes next, if we've got you there, we're good. So that idea of the endless media cycle, please read a book, please support mm -hmm. the industry. A book is a beautiful length of time for a human to have a thought. If you can't go hiking, literally because of you know the stay in place order, go hiking across the miles of written word that you find in a well-written book. Go to one, go find one of those books that I mentioned today and um and and let yourself think deeply about about that content so you're not buying in to this fractured false community of what do you call it cognitive dissonance mm. which is one thing selling you the other that is not how tr trust truth and ultimately hope are founded at all mm. well those are those are those those are wise words, and uh, I'm glad I asked that question. Um, let me ask you, we're at the bottom of the hour, so we need to end the discussion. And I could I could talk for a, a long time, and I'm looking forward to more of these conversations in coming years. Backpack, but, but, this thing is over. Let's go. Let's go, you and me. Let's hit the yeah. Well, let me ask you that question. You, have, you and I were talking, getting ready for this, and you've been explaining, you know, you get asked a lot by your friends, hey, why aren't you off, you know, camping in the Sierra by yourself? You're not going to be, you know, spreading the virus to anybody. And you've been a, you've been a good loyal Californian. You're saying, no, there'll be time for that. I need to, you know, stay in, you know, stay in my community. But given that when, you know, this, uh, when, when we modify all of that, where's the first place you want to go? What's, uh, what do you think is the first place, a gift you'll give yourself in terms of getting back into nature? Oh, it's, it's tough to say, you know, I mean, here it is. And here it is May, you know, uh, there's there, we, we, we've got, we had kind of a good cold push last weekend. So there's still snow in the Sierra up above, uh, you know, eight, 9,000 feet, but I'm always itching for that Sierra spring, which usually hits around June or July. When you go up there, when all of those little shadow, those little bits of shadowed glaciers are just trickling their diamond little streams down and the water tastes so good. And up over those granite talus slopes, the 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 bees are humming between uh, between uh, great stalks of, of of different colored flowers, the likes of which are endemic to just tiny little portions of different you know national forests up there and, and, and federal wilderness areas. So yeah, I can't wait to get up there ASAP. Um, that will be a welcome reward when we are all finally allowed to intermingle with and we're not stressing the local communities you know that's the big thing right i don't want to stress out uh communities that i pass through as i'm going hiking and stuff so i have yeah. very respectful of the stay in place order although i'll tell you it's been the it's been among the roughest things that i have ever needed to do um but of course that is uh that is um and that that's pretty easy <laughs> that's a pretty easy life as a matter of fact as i'm sitting here in beautiful wild scenic downtown oakland thinking about <laughs> well uh, listen this. you've given us all a gift by uh a thought provoking and and what i find to be a really optimistic uh hour um you know sharing all that you do um for those who are are joining us one thank you for for spending time with us um, two is, as, as Obi says, get out there and, and read a book. And uh, if you haven't uh, checked out uh, the, the couple that Obi's written on California nature, do yourself a, do yourself a favor. And, and then the, uh, the next book is on its way. Obi, when, is it, when are we going to be able to actually see it on a shelf when we can go into a bookstore? Yeah, September, September, September. Heyday Books will publish it. It'll be everywhere. Um, and hopefully we'll all be out in, in the open there. I'm going on an extensive book tour all over the state. So I hope you, I hope to see you all. And just, yeah, last, last thought is just as long as there is time, there is hope. So I appreciate you, you giving me the moniker optimist, but I really, I really hope that that is, that is, well, I really trust rather that that is a, that is just a, um, 
that's just a posture uh and when in fact what we've got here is is real thoughts and real boots on the ground doing good work we love this place and we have time so we have hope hmm. Perfect final words. Thank you, Obi. Um, thank thank you, you all. And um, we hope to all be together in person again very soon. Yeah, indeed. All right. Take care. Have a great day. Thanks, Wade. Bye.